the re- 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 yeah, ideal types was one of them. Okay. Sort of a, the, you, you build a model of so, how a general system, I mean, like bureaucracy, and that that can be helpful in trying to study a specific bureaucracy in, say, Iran okay. or Russia or someplace else. Uh, another very, very key, key, and key uh, idea or concept that he had was the conceptualization of power. He said that uh, power in political systems equals power plus legitimacy, and that makes authority. Power is simply the ability to say, you do this and somebody will do it. And legitimacy means you have a reason for th- that they do it. They have a reason to do it. Both you and y- the person you're ordering around share a certain idea that they uh, believe in and that they'll, that's the reason that they'll do it. So it's legitimate. So you have to have legitimacy plus power, and that equals authority. Okay. Yeah, that, um, yeah that's, that seems like uh, uh, that makes sense. It's, uh, so that was the ideal types, the uh, formulation for power, and uh, like, so w- was he? And then was there something about objectivity? Like, because right. you, I've always felt like one of the one of the almost your most uh, cherished values is just that, like you're going to tell you're an objective storyteller as a as a yeah. He wanted observer. to be scientific, so he wanted to be. Uh, he thought social science should be objective and value free, which is ironic because he also investigated values. For example, the values of the Protestant ethic. Yeah. So he said you can investigate values, but you have to be objective in investigating them. And you just have to write what they are rather than projecting your own values into the subject matter. Um, how, uh, so he was, he was somebody who was probably assigned reading in a few of your classes, in your political science yeah, classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you just got the sense as you're reading him like that this guy, did you end up reading his work to, as a primary text? I mean, I imagine there were excerpts at first. Right, like your teacher would assign uh, some yeah, excerpts. Yeah, read, read them as uh, yeah, as, as part of the primary text. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I just noticed is, as you're answering, like that he had this relationship with Marx. Not not relationship as in like people who knew each other, but but relationship in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, that he, him and Marx. Uh, are from a, a, a about the same time period. Yeah. And they have different, right. you know, they have different things to say about similar subject matter. Yeah. And, and it seems like Marx is, well, go ahead. He thought that Marx and Nietzsche were the most important thinkers of his generation, you know. Well, and it seems like, you know, that seems to bear out, like, today there's still a lot of people who, to whom Marx and Nietzsche are very important. Right. Um, but, uh yeah, but it, it sounds like, but he made more of an impression on you, would you say, like Weber... More so than Marx and Nietzsche? Or what, what do you think of Marx and Nietzsche, I guess? Well, Marx, of course, was the first real th- um, theorist of capitalism and the rise of the, rise of the West, as a, as a, as a, which spread, became, the West became dominant throughout the world in the late 19th and early 20th century because they, innov- they started capitalism, which had increased the productivity of human beings immensely and made made Western Europe a dominant power in the world. Uh, so he, he was the first to explore the underlying dynamics of capitalism, Marx was. And he did it not only in England and the European continent. Where he studied in France and Germany. Of course, he was a G- German, so he studied there first, and then he went to France and then to England. But he also studied the dynamics of capitalism in India. And so he was very, very great pioneer of social science. Yeah. And and he was so much more of a he was much more of a critic of capitalism, right? I mean certainly yes, that's he how was. we think of him yeah. today. Yeah, he was. But he tried to analyze its dynamics as well as its so he tried to analyze it from both a normative and from an empirical perspective. Okay. Whereas uh whereas 
Weber was more from an empirical perspective and less from a normative perspective. I well, guess. he he did. He also tried to analyze it both from empirical and normative perspective, but yeah. he tried to take the normative dynamics of capitalism more into account than Marx did. Marx thought that the di normative dimension was simply manufactured by the bourgeoisie for their own interests, and Weber would ac would attribute greater, uh, probably greater sincerity to the people who were thinking about these ideas rather than just simply using them to to advance their own interests. Uh, so in that, yeah, so in that sense, Marx's view is kind of this rebellious view uh, against the establishment. It's very anti-establishment in a way that um, maybe that's why it's so uh, it echoes so much in the culture today. Um, so what? When do you, like? Do you have the sense of a, a certain point? Like Weber is? Uh, would you would you say would you call Weber a big influence on you? What was his What was his impact on you personally? Mr. Weber. Oh yeah, very much. Yeah, very, very much an influence. Why do you think I so, know. or what? What do you? What was your? What was your big takeaway going into your career? He that, had a keen mind, and he mm -hmm. was able to order uh, his ideas into sort of very clear uh, concepts, like the concept of bureaucracy, which was one of these ideal types that he built to analyze bureaucracies in different different places, or the concept of authority or legitimacy and so forth he would uh very clear and uh got it really the fundamentals of how a society works i think modern society um okay so i guess i'll, I'll, I'll uh maybe we can come back to um weber uh but we'll, let's move over to so then you because you're studying political science Mm -hmm. And then you, you, your area uh, becomes China. Right. So uh, how did um, how did the communists end up taking power in China? How how does that how did that happen? Well, it took about a half a century. Uh, they the first successful revolution in China was not until 1911, and they overthrew the Tsarist dynasty, which had been in existence for over 4,000 years, uh, not continuously, but they had various dynasties, one dynasty after another, one ruling house after another. And they had various long periods in which there was great chaos in China, which no single ruling house was in charge, and they were fighting each other. But after, finally, the, that, that whole era of ruling kingdoms, ruling empires, came to an end in 1911 with the revolution uh, called the Xinhai Revolution started in Wuhan and overthrew the dynasty and uh, after a period of almost 50 years of turmoil in China, the Chinese Communist Party managed to defeat their enemies, drive them to Taiwan and install their revolutionary regime in Beijing in 1949. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, it I, took almost fifty years. I didn't, yeah, and I didn't. It's I hadn't realized that the warring kingdoms w were so much. Like, it's not you know. I guess in Russia, I have more of a sense of uh, the communists replacing this one empire. Right. But I guess in China, it's more like uh, uh, this. Well, they re replaced one empire too, but it was not the only empire that had existed. Okay. What I'm trying trying to say is that there are different dynasties, which mm -hmm. is this string of emperors mm -hmm. so that the, the Qing dynasty came into power in the 18th century mm -hmm. the Qing that was the last dynasty okay and that was overthrown in 1911 um, got it there were earlier dynasties right before the Qing was the Ming and then and and so forth okay um, so it goes way back 4,000 years okay of these feudal feudal system with this monarchical system uh, which which was which is I suppose is a capitalist system like right like well they call it a feudal feudal system a feudal interesting system because they didn't really have capitalism until the twentieth century I mean they started in the late nineteenth century but they didn't really have a full fledged capitalist system until the twentieth century early twentieth century uh, so so China's never really done much capitalism like they because the Marx and Marx was uh, writing for. Um, 
Europe where capitalism was more the norm, but it never really, uh, China didn't have that industrial revolution yet. or They, they didn't, didn't have an indigenous capitalist system. That's right. Okay. Until the Westerners imposed it, you know, came in and uh, with imperialism sort of defeated the, uh, the colonial, I mean, the uh, imperial rulers. Okay. The Opium War and so yep. forth. And they and demonstrated to them that they had to develop capitalism. Or they, they'd be run over. They'd be rolled over by the West. So, so perhaps that was like a, a, a what do you call it, a, a infant capitalism that was brewing, maybe with the with the death of the Qing Dynasty, but it didn't hadn't gotten far. Well, it wasn't. We wouldn't call it capitalism because capitalism is a specific type of uh, economic system in uh -huh. which you have uh, owners of the means of production. You have a proletariat, a working class, and you have machinery. You have capital. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't have all of that. They, they had a, more or less an agricultural system uh -huh. with crafts, of course, and things like that as, as well. But they didn't really have all this machinery, and they didn't have this whole apparatus of capitalism until the West came and sort of demonstrated superiority through the force of arms. Uh, defeating them in the Opium War and other colonial wars. And right. So they, they decided that they had to adapt. But they didn't get very take far. Them, take it them a long time, took them a long time to be able to adapt, but they started immediately in the 20th century, and I think. They were in the process of adapting as the right. communists took right. over. And the process of being run over, too. Uh, was, was Adam Smith... Um, what he wrote in, he was an, a British guy, right? Right. But so was, had the did he write before the Industrial Revolution? Or he must not have because during he, it, during, during it. So he was during, already during the English he, Industrial Revolution. And so he was kind of named he the, probably the pioneer of the analysis of capitalism. Yeah, I don't think I don't know whether he ever used the term capitalism, but he certainly analyzed it, and his idea of that you can have um, trade among different people. And that both sides can win, mm -hmm. and that it can hold the whole thing can work without an authority supervising it strictly. In other words, you have tr trade and yeah. mutual exchange, and they yeah. can benefit both sides. So they called it the invisible hand. The yeah. whole thing can work without people telling you what to do. Without uh, necessarily, no. He sort of everybody agrees that that's not the way things actually are you still have authority you have still have power and mm -hmm. people something having political power over other people but the idea was that the economic market can be an autonomous thing it can be it can run by itself uh with this invisible hand that everybody benefits got it yeah um yeah what um so okay so uh he was in the 18th century so then uh my next question was, uh, do the, did the Chinese, um, what do you think the Marxist critique of China would be? Like, did the Chinese really do Marxism or not so, or did they fail to do all the things that Marx would have, like, would Marx have liked the Chinese regime or do you think he would have been, you know, is that what he envisioned? Well, that's a very uh, good question. And it's very controversial, of course, because the Chinese insist very adamantly that they are socialists and that they are Marxist society, mm -hmm. and that they are probably the leading Marxist society today. I mean, mm -hmm. since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is no longer Marxist. Uh, Putin doesn't claim to be Marxist. Uh, so the Chinese insist that they are the leading, probably the leading socialist society today and that they are very very marxist but outside observers would question that because there's a great deal of inequality in china that's that's one of the factors mm -hmm. and the political system is not uh they call it a dictatorship of the proletariat or a dictatorship of the working class uh but whether the working class actually runs affairs in china is very questionable um, it's actually the Communist Party. Oh, sure, yeah. The Communist Party that considers itself the vanguard. We're the leaders of the proletariat, so we run things for the proletariat in the name of the proletariat, of the working, cl uh, the, of the working class, that is. So uh, those are two, two key uh, 
questions that you'd want to ask. Who who actually runs things, mm-hmm. and who actually benefits, and so forth. And the second is, why isn't there greater equality between, since it's a working class society and everybody should be equal? Why isn't there greater equality there? Yeah, yeah. Um, that that also reminds me of what you were saying about uh, Weber came up with these ideas of power. Uh-huh. And Marx has these ideas about power also. Right. Do you have like uh do you think the how how do those two ideas of power differ like how, what do you think the the Weberian I well the, Marx uh joined the Communist Party and he was a leader in the Communist Party and so he right. thought that the Communist Party should be play definitely a leadership role but he also believed that uh uh, cap- capitalism was inherently unequal and in that it would eventually be overcome and overturned uh, by a proletarian revolution, a w- revolution of the working class that would distribute things more equally and uh, turn the power over from the bourgeoisie, the ownership class, over to the working class. And uh, you could argue that that happened in the revolution. It was turned over to the working class, but then the Communist Party took charge of the working class and uh, told the working class what was in their best interest. So, and what would what do you think Weber would say about that? Like, what's his uh, it's a, his dynamic of power? Uh, well, he'd say that the working class took over and uh, set up a bureaucracy to run things. Bureaucracy under the Communist Party, and that was basically a dictatorship under the Communist Party. So in a way, it sounds like I think Marx is kind of a, a lonely voice, probably most. Uh, well, no, he had a party behind him. Well, that's he, for sure, yeah. And the strongest party at the time is not the Bolsheviks. The strongest party at the time was the German Social Democratic Party, which is a Marxist party in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so I, I guess, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's... It's hard to get a it's hard to get a sense of you know these characters in the history and where sure, they what their yeah, viewpoints yeah, are. Yeah, um, yeah. But but uh, but maybe I guess what I'm thinking when I said um, maybe Marx is a lonely voice is like well he's his outline of a utopia is yeah. almost like for, for uh, amongst other other scientific peers like Weber maybe his idea of a utopia a, a scientific peer would be skeptical like well. It doesn't seem like that's what's happening, you know what I mean? In these communist societies, it doesn't seem like the power is going to the people the way you said it would. You know? Well, during Marx's life, the Communist Party had never taken over in any country. Right. So that was an v- open-ended experiment still. Right. Right. Um, okay, let's, let's, uh, let me segue uh, over to, um, again, further pushing down the road into history. So uh, I'm not sure if th- this is... I know, I know the, I know a little bit about this, but I haven't read read it in a while. Can you tell us who was Lu Xiaoqi, and how did he attract your interest? And w- well, he was a, uh, a Chinese communist, uh, and one of the earliest earliest uh, small group of commun- Chinese communists who uh, led in the revolution, the Chinese Communist Revolution, and he was. Born, I think, around the late 19th century, went to he studied in Russia for a while, and then he came back to China, and led in the revolution all through the 20th century, and finally became vice chair of the Chinese Communist Party in 19 uh, and the, uh, 1930 uh, 1949. I'm not sure. I have to check that, but. He came in when they w- when the revolution. He became the vice chair of the Chinese Communist Party under Mao Zedong, mm-hmm. and uh, eventually became chairman of the Chinese Communist Party in the late 1950s. Mm-hmm. And he believed in a slightly different type of Chinese Communist revolution than Mao. He, b- he believed more like Marx, as a materialist rather than an idealist. And Mao was more of an idealist in his. In Mao's idea, the idea of communism should take prevalence, should be the should be dominant in how communism is shaped. But Liu Shaoqi was more of a materialist, and he built, believed that the material factors of production and relations of production and so forth should be very important in deci- deciding 
how the revolution should proceed after they'd taken power, after the Chinese Communist Party took, pl- took power in 1949. So that led up until this, to this great split that culminated in the great proletarian culture revolution from 1966 to 1976 in China. My, I was gonna. I was gonna ask how bad was the Cultural Revolution because well, it was a mixed thing. It yeah, was yeah. not entirely bad. Okay, it was. Uh, Mao called on the youth of China mm-hmm. to overthrow the party, mm-hmm. and the party didn't dare defend themselves because he was the head of the party as well. Mm-hmm. So he was going to purge the party with by mobilizing the youth against the party, which is a very bold and reckless experiment and it caused great chaos in China for about 10 years. So that's the that's the It's very confusing yeah. because he was encouraging the youth to attack the party members. He said that they were bourgeoisie within the party and he wanted to purge them, to kick them out. So he called on the youth to attack the party. So my temp- I mean the way I'm tempted to just look at that is just to really dismiss Mao as this um, you know corrupt individual who uh, is make, getting people to work, like getting his underlings and his competition are, you know, knocked out by turning people against each other and causing all this chaos, but allowing himself to stay on top. Is that, that that's probably how, uh, is that, is that actually a, a, a conventional view or is that a sort of simplistic well, if you view? Well, the Chinese communists or the Chinese historians, mm-hmm. they would say that his great contribution was to lead the revolution itself. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he was a great tactician, a great strategist. And uh, he, he was lucky. Right. Because they had the Japanese come and invade China and that probably prevented the uh, the nationalists from crushing the con- Chinese communists, which they could, which they could have done uh, in the 19... 19- 30s, if the Japanese hadn't been there invading and distracting the, the, the Nationalist Party from its crusade against the communists. So, right, so, so he was, so like, he was kind of played a George Washington kind of role. He was a general. Yeah, he led and the, then he the, became the, the president. But I guess my perception he, is he that, he like, drove the drove the Nationalists out of China into a, in, into Taiwan. That's, mm-hmm. he did, yeah. Yeah, that, so that seems that seems yeah, but but would you is, are there are there still a lot of defenders for his conduct during the Great Leap Forward and all that or well people thought that the Great Leap Forward was a failure uh-huh. or it caused too much de- too much deaths yep. too many deaths yep. and too many people starving to death during it was is economically misconceived because mm-hmm. he he ran the Great Leap Forward based on his ideas without having clear idea of how the economics should work the uh, and so it resulted in great starvation and great economic setback for china and then after that he decided that the reason for the failure of the great leap forward was not because it was ill conceived but because it uh the ideas of the revolution had not yet permeated the people and so they 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 were confused and so he had to have a cultural revolution not a material revolution, but a cultural revolution to change people's ideas. And so that was the idea of the cultural revolution, that you change people's thinking, and that that would be the answer to the progress, the further progress. But the cultural revolution, by general sort of admission today, even in China, did not succeed in changing people's ideas. It changed them maybe for that 10 years when it was going on, but then after it was over, the, the, it didn't really inc- improve the economy. So people were not better off, and so where people didn't really have an incentive to uh, to embrace this, these advanced ideas that he was trying to propagate, and so they after after Mao died, you had the rise of Deng Xiaoping, and his ideas were to return more to the material material aspect of things, like Liu Xiaoqi did. So he and Liu Xiaoqi were very much uh, a pair. I mean, that they had, they had the right. similar ideas about you had to have the economy working, and you had to have a high growth rate and things like that. You had to have everything working to be able to realize these great ideas that Mao had uh, put down. And they were uh, and they were cohorts they were con- too. They worked together, right? Like they were they were friends right. or colleagues. Deng Xiaoping and, and they bo- both believed and Liu Xiaoqi. 
this different approach to the revolution, right? But uh, but Deng Xiaoping kind of survived better. He got he had a yeah, better he, outcome. He stayed alive, right? And Liu Xiaoqi died, yeah. and died somewhat in disgrace or not? In, oh yes, in disgrace. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that was kind of was it that that tragic outcome that kind of attracted you? It was like somebody should tell this guy's story. He was a leading victim of the Cultural Revolution. Uh huh. Yeah. So in a way, your first two books are about the Cultural Revolution because right. I mean, of course, the second one's a continuous revolution, but the first one is about Liu Xiaoqi. But he's right. That is uh, a book about Liu Xiaoqi is about the Cultural Revolution. Right. Okay. Liu, it's called Liu Xiaoqi and the Cultural Revolution. Oh, it it is. Okay, yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I forgot that. Was the, I forgot that was the case. I thought I was making a a new insight, but uh, apparently that was not. Uh. It was already in the title. Okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, this, this is kind of asking the same question in a different way. But I, I, do you think that Mao Zedong was evil? Was was uh, was he was he uh, throughout his th throughout his life, or just during maybe just during the during the Cultural Revolution? Do you think his actions were evil? And uh, or and do you think? Okay, yeah, that's, I, I have some. I also was curious, like whether you thought that, you know, you said he clearly was a more successful kind of a heroic figure. During the uh, the Ch the communists taking over China, you know, leading, you know, expelling their enemies to to Taiwan, mm -hmm. and it, so it doesn't seem like he, there's any reason to think of him as evil in that case. But but uh, but yet maybe maybe he was like maybe that he's that kind of pow powerful person that takes center stage or whatever, and that he's just clearing out. So like one one possibility is here here's this guy who climbs to power and then starts really. Going after all his anybody close to him. Another possibility is that uh, he's a good guy, but then power corrupts, and he starts becoming acting in these evil you know, or, or so-called evil ways as a as a as the leader of the country. And a third possibility is that uh, you know that's just a miss. That's a not really a good way to view it. That he that he maybe he was a good intentioned guy who just it didn't work out what he was trying to do. Well, you have these giant figures like Hitler or mm -hmm. Mao or Stalin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they don't try to do evil, They but they have definite ideas about how the world should be changed. Mm -hmm. So they want to lead in change, and they're quite ruthless. Quite often, they're quite ruthless in doing anything necessary uh, without unconditionally to, to achieve this change. I mean, Hitler was... A, Determined to start a war to cha to restore Germany's territories and power and so forth, and he was willing to kill a lot of people to do that. Mm -hmm. And Mao was willing to lead the country into quite um, difficult economic situation because he was determined to create a socialist society. Mm -hmm. And so he. They were not intentionally evil. They were, but they were very determined to uh, to push their ideas through, regardless of human resistance, mm -hmm. and at great cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So you, you don't. Yeah. Um, so you see it as like a it was a, a failure more than a, a more than a um, more than a. I mean, I guess it's a tragedy too. The people dying, but that's more like most every period in history has has all those types of deaths. Yeah, but uh, he certainly caused a lot of them. Yeah. 20, 30 million people probably starved to death in the Great Leap Forward. Yeah. that And that's before the Cultural Revolution. That's the... That's before the... That's in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And that, and that's just... And, and that's just and trying to put this... Make this communism thing work. Like, he's just pushing... He's just pushing co this communist regime in the in the Great Leap Forward. Like he right, hadn't he hadn't right. started he was trying to achieve s communism and great in a great leap in mm -hmm. a great leap forward. He was going to achieve communism, leap over the social socialism. See, they they distinguish between socialism and communism. So mm -hmm. socialism is from each according to his ability to each according to his uh, contribution, mm -hmm. and communism is from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. A more advanced and more egalitarian type of com uh, system. Mm -hmm. and he was going to achieve this in one great leap. That was mo that was motivated partly by his ideals and partly by his desire to 
uh, get ahead of the Soviet Union, with which with with, with yeah. which he was having a lot of dis- ideological disputes at that time about the best way to do this. So he had came up with this idea: a cultural revolution, trans- people, transform people's thinking. But it but it confused people and it set them against each other and so forth, and it created quite a chaotic uh, system that didn't really work economically. Do you think it's wrong-headed to call politicians evil? Like, do you think that? Um, do you like? Do you even believe? Do you believe in evil? I can, they can certainly cause a lot of damage. Yeah, they can certainly kill a lot of people, and it can be worked it worked. They, you can say that they didn't, but I don't think it's. I think it can be kind of confusing to talk about evil because they think that they're doing right, and they be, they have a bunch of followers that they think they're. Do, Mm-hmm. That they follow them and to do that, so you want to know why they do what they do. Uh, to just call them evil, I mean, for example, Mao. I mean, Mao's reasons for launching the Cultural Revolution were b- by no means pure. He did, it was not simply to realize this ideal; it was also to get rid of his enemies. Yeah, that's what that's that's where the so, evil so thought. That's where my thought of evil comes in. I think right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, but. So it's a but, but those are mixed motives. So so in a way, it's it's unscientific to like uh, evil is not very scientific term or it's not really helpful in a scientific uh, approach. Well, you can say it in a in a broad sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just certainly agree that he his general impact uh, was quite destructive. Mm-hmm. Quite destructive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, I want to. Uh, this is a uh, odd. Sorry, you, you want to say something else there? Uh, okay, I was just the uh, this next question is um, about how China is just uh, seems like. My question is: Did China always feel exotic to you, in a way that Europe doesn't? And uh, yeah, for centuries they were cut off from Europe, mm-hmm. and there was very little interconnection, inter interchange. You had Marco Polo come, and you had the. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Yan Dynasty, the Mongols, which were uh, sort of a Chinese, uh, ra- I mean, a cynic, r- cynic race, I think, of, of t- Mongols, come and invade parts of Europe. But there's you know, very little inter- interaction between these two great civilizations, the Chinese civilization over there, and the Western, Western and uh, Western European civilization. Right. So, and so, so little interaction. They're isolated from us. Do you think they're so – maybe, and their language is very different, yes? Oh, I mean, yeah. It's a difficult language to yeah, learn? Based on ideographs, figures, rather than an alphabet. There's no alphabet. Do you think that'll make them always uh, different from – like, w- 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 you know, we're having this globalism, this moment of globalism. Yeah. But do you think that because they're uh, exotic in the, historically and their language is different, do you think it's unlikely that we'll ever – uh, be, you know, well, they're globalizing, and that means that they're uh, integrating into the world economy and mm-hmm. the world uh, so- social system and so forth. And a lot of Chinese are eager to do that. Yeah. Despite the fact that uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of misgivings about uh, about modern capitalism, and he doesn't want China to be capitalist. He's fighting that. He's fighting that. But they, uh, so they have this two contradictory urges one is to be modern modern which means basically being capitalistic and the other is to uphold a socialist system that they're different different type of system from the west and to compete with it and to overcome it um so uh, right uh and i guess uh would you i i would do you think that your work uh learning chinese as you did and and uh having conversations about their political system does it help is that part of like that b- helps bring the cultures together? Like uh, you help Chinese people understand Americans, or you help Americans p- understand Chinese people a little bit? Well, not many of my works have been translated into Chinese. I think only one book has been translated into Chinese. Which so I wh- had which much one? Ba- impact on the on the Liu Xiaoqi book. Okay, and uh, it hasn't been. It wasn't completely translated either. There certain parts were left out because they're considered uh, dangerous, I guess. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, so it doesn't have much impact on China, I, I don't think. But uh, I think 
maybe in America it's very very tiny Im impact on how we think about China. Uh huh. Well, I mean, I I'm sure you just by interacting with a lot of I I imagine that you would have the most impact on China when you show up there and talk to them. You know, and then they then they see like oh, there's an American like that does some goodwill. That's like a goodwill ambassador a little bit. Well, uh, that would be nice. <laughs> Um, so what was, and what was it like speaking Chinese to Chinese people? Did it, um, did that change your perspective on the challenges that that country faces? Uh, well, they were very, I've, they, they have very good audiences. They mm -hmm. didn't necessarily agree with me, but they always listened very keenly to when I lectured over there. Yeah. What about, what about, uh, do you watch, you like watching movies? Um, do Chinese movies, uh, do you have an overall impression of Chinese movies? And uh, well, they had their great flowering, I think, in the nineteen nineteen uh, hundreds, nineteen seventies and eighties. Uh -huh. uh, after the Cultural Revolution, there was a cultural thaw after the Cultural Revolution, which ended in 1976. And so in the 1980s and 1990s, I would say, in the 2000, early 2000s, there was a great flowering of interest in, uh, in Chinese culture, and there was great creativity, and a, a movie industry was born and had some really excellent movies on, on Chinese. Would you, would, would, did they teach you anything about the Chinese people? Like, would you say from, from their movies that it changed your view of the, of, the, of the Chinese? Well, it gives you insight. Like when you watch a movie about anything, it's, it's a distortion because it's artistic refashioning of, what, of events that may have occurred or the, similar to events that may have occurred. But it's, uh, yeah, it can, it can, it can sort of, Give you a sense of the, of the spirit of the people at that time. Um, and their problems that they faced, and and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The I mean, I, uh, I guess I'm, I don't know, I don't know a lot of these Chinese movies. I know that, I'm imagine, you know, I know that the Hong Kong. Like uh, Jackie Chan comes from this Hong Kong, action scene, right? Like there's a. There's well, a, Hong Kong movies have a different or a different track. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they've always been in the colonial or uh, the Western sphere, and so they have a different type of tradition. Their uh -huh. movies are they have a huge m movie industry in Hong Kong. Yeah. But they put more emphasis on entertainment and less on education. Uh, the Chinese Communists have always tried to try to guide the movie industry so that it educates people in the direction. So they embrace socialism and so forth, and so it's been a s somewhat different track. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Also, like the, uh, I guess the conservative wing of the United States government has always sort of represented people who are kind of anti-communist. I would mm -hmm. would you say? And then, I mean, I I don't know. Is that? Um, and I guess th so. A lot of the it's weird that having these uh, you have you, you studying China, you have a certain view on communism. But meanwhile, here in America, there's like a right people sort of going back and forth, sort of pushing and pulling on the value of socialism and whether it works and stuff like that, right? Well, in the 1990s, uh, after the after the Tiananmen incident, oh, yeah. in 1989, yeah, yeah. Uh, and before that, during the in, uh, 1980s and 1990s, there was a period of detente, or what they called detente, or loosening. And uh, uh, the idea was that we would support China against the Soviet Union. So that motivated us to give a lot of support, both technical support and economic support against to China to uh fight against the Soviet Union, which we considered our main enemy at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was when, up until about, oh. until the fall of the Soviet Union in, 19, in, the, in 1991, that was that held the relationship together. And then after 1991, uh, suddenly China started uh, 
adopting the market. And that provided an opportunity for a lot of American capitalists to move into China and to make a lot of money into China. And so that, and they put pressure on the politi American politicians. And so they encouraged uh, this combination of uh, American capitalism, seeing an opportunity and, and politicians wanting to, wanting to uh, uh, create a, a good relationship with China sort of created a period of thaw or detente between China and the United States that lasted up until about, oh, I'd say it up until about 2010. Yeah, uh, oh, the, the, at, at which point um, relations kind of sort of, apart, sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, was it, I was I have, was there a 20th century dream to democratize China? Oh yeah. Is that still, and is that still, do you still, do you still have hopes like that? Definitely there's that dream mm -hmm. and that's the way people sort of rationalized their, uh, friendship or they're doing business in China that if they do business in China, it'll lead China to become more capitalistic. And if they become more capitalistic, Eventually, they become more democratic as well. So that was that was a sort of uh, that was the sort of animating idea behind this uh, uh, opening to China, this thaw with China. Uh, what is what is uh, what is the status of women's rights in China or feminism in China? Well, on the one hand, you can say that the in terms of employment, uh, you have an even higher percentage of women in China that are employed full-time than they, than they are in the United States. Mm -hmm. So in terms of equal rights, they have the equal right of employment. They're not, as, they're not paid as much. I think still they're not paid as much as men, but they do get employed and they have a full labor market for women and so forth. But in terms of political uh, rise, and, and a lot of economic, a lot of women have achieved a great deal economically. They become rich, not a lot of women, but some women have become outstandingly successful in becoming rich in the private market sector, mm -hmm. but in politi politics, they don't they don't have any high seats in the hmm. leadership. So, why do you think that is? I don't know. They, uh, but it's but the Chinese Communist Party is largely led by men, right? And yeah. that's especially true under under Xi Jinping. Yeah, I mean, it's not I, you know, it's not like a. In America, the I guess Christianity is sort of like a cultural influence, but that's not so much in China, right? It's, it would be. You know. Oh no, Christianity is definitely not uh, not supported by the Communist Party. Right. It's a rival think rival idea system. Uh, so are all is religion is still pretty much uh, on mute over there. They don't. They don't. Uh, no religions are really developed. I mean, they had the Falun Gong. Thing for a little they day. think religion yeah. is the opium of the masses. Okay, as Marx put it. So that's in that it's, one. It's a, it's a superstition. Yeah. Huh. That's one. Uh, They're materialists. That's one area where Marx Marx would approve of their, the way they've developed as a society. Yeah, yeah. He, he probably wouldn't approve with their personality cult. Mm. You know, putting one leader on a pedestal as a sort of a person who can do no wrong mm -hmm. which almost a relig in almost a religious way so that you uh, but so he probably would have some, some difficulty with that but uh, he would certainly agree with that the religion is has is, has no valid place in how a society should be run it's, a, it's purely fantasy um uh, did your perspective on politics change after you got married and had a family? Uh, were you ever able to, uh, did, it, did it cause you to be able to bond with colleagues about family or, or, uh, or people that you were writing about? Did you end up writing about them in terms of their families? Certainly you bond with your friends and so forth when they have families. It's, it's social and it's entertainment. But I, my ideas about politics didn't really change, no. Mm -hmm. Um. What are your big observations on American politics? Uh, is America, well, is America, America in decline? Politics? Are you worried about the, env the environment? 
Uh, well, everybody's worried about the environment, you mm -hmm. know, and everybody's concerned that the uh, uh, environment is uh, going to incre create increasing difficulties for us uh, in the weather systems and so forth. <coughs> and so in that general sense, of course, we have to worry about the environment. The, the trick is to try to improve the environment and to stop um, pollution and things like this. At the same time, you keep the economy running. So that's the trick. And uh, to not let the environmental concerns completely uh, drown out your, uh, your economic the economic necessity to keep the economy running at a healthy pace so that people can make a living. And what about the uh, just how how things are going in America more generally? Uh, any thoughts? How 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 you think we're th things are going? Well, we're in a period of great confusion, but then all, the Americans have always been in a period of great confusion. Hmm. I think. Yeah, that's that's been. From the from the perspective of being visiting other countries, when you talk to people over there, they always sort of see America as or America is a unique country. It's mm -hmm. a settler country because only the Indian, the indigenous Americans, or what we call the Indians, mm -hmm. are the only people who lived here originally, mm -hmm. and they play a very negligible role in the contemporary uh, American political and social and economic system. Mm -hmm. So it's all these settlers that come from all over the world and fight with each other <laughs> over various things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, so so it's going so it's going. Uh, you don't. It, it seems like it's it's a little. There's there's some there's always some fighting and some chaos, but it's managed. Maybe yeah. and without as without the violence of a cultural revolution. Well, we have violent episodes. I mean, we certainly yeah. didn't treat the Indians very well. Yeah. And we made war on the Mexicans and uh, the Spaniards in the Spanish Spanish American War mm -hmm. and so forth. So we had a civil war. Yeah. Well, the civil war we made war on each other. Right. Uh, right. Right. So, so we've had we have our violence as well, huh? Mm hmm. Um. So uh, this is a stealing this from this other podcast I watch, but he always asks people um, what if there, you have like any books like uh, he often asks his guests to uh, choose three books that they might recommend like any books that maybe influenced you could be uh, novels or uh, or pol it could be you know more it could be books by colleagues or anything books when you read growing up uh, that were like formative for you uh as you were um uh, you know in your career or yeah but they're not really relevant to my uh career yeah yeah uh, perfect that's the, the the less relevant to your career the the, the better probably yeah uh -huh. well i i really like stendhal's the red and the black okay what's that about it's about a young man, Julian Sorel, and how he has to decide between a career in the church and a career in the uh, in the uh, uh, a social career, I guess. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, and uh, I also very much like uh, Kafka's short stories. That had a huge impact on me, uh, just in terms of uh, imaginative literature. Not just the metamorphosis, but all the other ones too. Right, huh? right, right. And a, a third one, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of a third one offhand. Yeah. Well, three. Three is a random number. There's no reason it should be yeah. three. Um. Uh, what did you think about uh, COVID? Well, it was a deadly pandemic. It mm -hmm. was a huge, biggest pandemic. When we pandemic we've had since the early 20th century the flu pandemic at that time killed a lot of millions of people and then this is the f second biggest pandemic uh that we've had mm -hmm. and it killed millions of people so very devastating and uh um and any impact like if, w w do you see it uh having had an impact on um like has it has our has your world changed since COVID, or has our 
culture changed because of it? Well, we, everybody's become more conscious of the of the uh, dangers of uh, being of catching something, mm -hmm. of uh, the communicability of disease. And in many countries, people, people still wear masks because of that danger, that risk of the spread of disease. And we still haven't conquered COVID. I mean, it's still going around. There's still people catching COVID today. There are new strains all the time. So we really haven't overcome it. And, and we're, we have to prepare for the next pandemic as well, which uh, yeah. everybody agrees will probably happen. So we need, it's been a huge uh, fill-up or encouragement to the pharmaceutical industry hmm. and uh, and biological bio, biological research, so we can it's, at least it's done that. It's really helped incentivize the people to, to strengthen the biological research forward. Um, the last thing uh, uh, I have my this podcast I call it screenaholics, screenaholics. So, uh, have you given any thought to the issue of screen addiction? What do you think about uh, screen addiction. Well, it's a bad thing. <laughs> have you come into? Have you no, have you noticed it? Do you? Do you, do you yeah, we we read everything on the screen. Uh, print media is going out of fashion. Uh, people send things on the screen and they don't bother bother to bother to print it out. You're supposed to print it out yourself and so forth and so. You spend all your time in front of the screen. It's probably not too good for your eyes either. Mm -hmm. Um. The, the, uh, well, the other, uh, there's also d from stealing from another podcast, but he often, uh, likes to ask at the end, uh, what is the meaning of life? Well, in our society, uh, you have to create your own meaning. In China, you don't. Uh, they get set down your meaning for you, uh, if they can. Uh, you can rebel against it, but it's difficult. But they c put a s clear path before you and say you should follow this path. And then in other societies, in traditional societies, they also do that. They have a sort of traditional, tradition-based path for a young person uh, that you should follow. But our society leaves it completely open, so you have to create your own meaning. Uh, unless, you, unless you belong to a church or something that will create it for you. Uh, yeah. Um. Well, uh, I I think that's actually uh, I think that's a, a that's pretty interest cool that how that circles back. That's interesting. That China, you're talking about how they like they'll choose your career for you, right? Like they'll do a civil service exam and they'll say this is your job. I didn't take a civil service. Exam. No, 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 I mean like in China. In China, they would. Uh, that's what happens. Uh, for for people for Chinese people, um, they'll. Uh, because you mentioned, you said in China, you they they decide your meaning for you. Yeah. Uh, but the, do, do you mean also they'll, no, they'll I decide mean your career? In the sense that they should strengthen strengthen the state and strengthen China. Okay. So it's nationalism and socialism. Okay. That is that creates the meaning, and that you should live within that context: nationalism and socialism. Nationalism strengthening China, and socialism building the socialist system. I mean, I guess it really that really answers a lot of the questions that I have about education like in in america we have a lot of you know we have the separation of church and state and they don't have it they don't that's i mean they don't have that in china but they just don't have church so it's just state 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 they have without the question they have the chinese communist party yeah and so that's that's part of education is right uh teaching people to be loyal to the party right, right. but here we don't we here we we don't have that right we have a pluralist what they call a pluralist system Mm -hmm. Different authority structures that compete for your allegiance, and the idea, I guess, and that's a very capitalist idea that you have these. Uh, the competition w leads to improvement. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, uh, I guess capitalism has a has its track record as an economic system, but it makes. But I guess it can be a system of ideas also. Um, Definitely, right? Yeah. John Stuart Mill wrote about that, about the ideas, um, huh? And uh, ideas, a uh, market of ideas, a market of ideas, and, and the, his his idea was that the best idea was emerge from this competition of ideas, in the free market of ideas. But I'm not sure that's always true because the guy with the loudest voice 
may not necessarily have the best ideas. Mm -hmm. But that was John Stuart Mill's idea. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe that's a uh, one last thing I could ask is what just do you think? What do you think uh, Weber's relevance is today, or what do you think that he would say if he were here today? If, what do you think his uh, his his uh, impressions would be on? On uh, our our social situation, or on on this this on uh, on the this, the way the sociology is going, how it's being studied, these kind of things. Well, he had a generally speaking, he had a rather pessimistic view of capitalism. He thought it was a, an iron cage because he thought bureaucracies are, were the dominant sort of organizational form, and bureaucracies are a very hierarchical organization. So he saw bu bureaucracies dominating in the government and in private sector, in corporations, and so forth. I don't know what he'd say today, because uh, you still have that. You still have bureaucracies very playing a very important role in the government, the huge bureaucracy at the, in the United States and uh, in Washington, D.C., but also you have huge corporations like Google, Google and General Motors and all these uh, huge corporations. Uh, so he generally was a, he was liberal, and so he didn't really like that, and he he would probably be concerned about that. Uh, yeah, and that's even. I mean, it's interesting to think of. I have a hard time not thinking about all politics as this political spectrum from left to right, and everything uh -huh. everything is on a spectrum from left right. to right. Right. And and then when we're talking about China and the U.S., I think of well, China's in the left, and the and uh, uh, communism's the left, and capitalism's the right, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I know it's not that simple, right? Like that's just you know certain issues or sitting somebody falls left in one place and right in another. So uh, it's kind it's sort of fa it's a fascinating conversation, especially hearing about Marx, uh, Marx and Weber and their their contributions to it. Um, well, some people thought of it more of as a circle. Okay. So communism, for example, which is on the left, and fascism, which is on the far right, mm -hmm. were actually pretty close together mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, yeah. they, they had yeah. very, very totalitarian structures, uh, trying to tell everybody what exactly what they should do and so forth. So I mean it's not completely true because there are differences between the two, but in mm -hmm. that so, and there's some sense that they're both totalitarian systems. Yeah, I mean that was a question I wrote down, but I didn't end up asking it. But it was uh, whether whether you thought communism and totalitarianism are are bound to be linked, you know? Yeah, and uh, I think communism and under Xi Jinping has certainly has become much more totalitarian. Yeah. They tell people exactly what sort of clothes are appropriate to wear, what sort of language to use. That's very, very fine-tuned control. Yeah. Over every over everybody. That's that, that's what they are aiming for, and they have a huge pervasive surveillance system, electronic surveillance system, to make sure that they do do that. Now they can't completely control everything. I mean, but they, but they they would like to think that would be that would they. That would that would be the what they'd like to have, and I I, I guess the that that sort of uh, maybe there's and there, yeah it's, it's interesting when you add a different term to it like like fascism that that brings yeah a different and um, a different uh, picture to whether it's a, a spectrum that's a, a line or a circle you know mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, so. Definitely interesting uh, stuff. Well, um, uh, Dad, thanks a lot for s sitting down with me. It's a it's it's a great pleasure to My pleasure. Uh, hear you t hear you talk about this stuff. And uh, and I wish I weren't. Uh, I wish I I'm, I know there's a lot more uh, I could uh, we could talk about, but I uh, I'm pretty sure Mom wants us to go upstairs for dinner here soon. Right. So, but uh, but I, I I think you've done a lot of uh, great work. Um, like I said, sort of uh, helping helping Americans and Chinese people understand each other, and uh, and a lot of important reflections on politics. And so, thanks for you know all the work you did in that in your field. My pleasure. Yeah.